All right, welcome back everyone. We're so pleased to uh, have Patrick Leroux, Associate Dean of Research in-house with us here at Force Space today, sitting down with researchers. Uh, I'll let Patrick introduce his next guest, but I'll just mention that we are live streaming these conversations to YouTube, so if you'd like to revisit them or share them across your network, they're avail available on Concordia University's Fourth Space YouTube channel. That's a mouthful. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, welcome back, those of you who are joining us again, and welcome those of you who are uh, joining us for the first uh, conversation. This is our second conversation of 12 with 17 researchers uh, across the faculty. So we have researchers in the humanities, in the social sciences, in the natural sciences, and the health sciences, junior, early career, mid-career, more senior colleagues, the idea has been to, um, to talk to as many interesting researchers as we could. Um, my, my job is to basically help uh, steer, help, orient, uh, and assist in, in, um, in, in the research in the faculty. And it's, it's an amazing job because I get to meet researchers, I get to read their grants, I, need, I, I get to strategize with them, but this is the first time that we have public conversations. Ray Vance back, uh, it's a pleasure. We, we've met a few times, <laughs> uh, most recently uh, walking to your lab, actually. We did a, a lab tour with, uh, with our new, uh, new faculty, um, which was like, uh, an amazing experience. And th this was organized by uh, Rebecca Ackman from my office, and she's been pivotal also in, in, in organizing us uh, today, <laughs> um, get, getting some of the material together um, so that we can have this conversation. Um, I'll, I'll present you, and, and then I guess we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, so uh, Ray Mansbach is an assistant professor of physics. Um, they hold a tier two CRC in bio, bio sorry, in com computational biophysics. I anticipated the bio. Um, they're junior co-director of the Center for Research in Molecular Modeling, uh, which, which was for the longest time was housed in chemistry and, and now is shared chemistry. We're trying to sort of move it into yeah. physics and chemical materials engineering, exactly. biology. So across departments and across faculties. Yeah. Um, and their work is, is, is really cutting edge research at the intersection of computational biophysics and deep learning. Um, I've been absolutely fascinated by, you know, already you've mentioned uh, biophysics, the physics department, uh, co uh, computational uh, uh, chemistry, uh, connections with uh, uh, chemical materials, and, and uh, I'm, I'm saying this all wrong, I'm sure. Um, and um, uh, Ray is also interested in multi-scale uh, modeling, machine learning, and molecular dynamics for biophysics. Um, you came to us uh, at Concordia in August 2020, so yes, I did. <laughs> so another colleague who came uh, at the uh, so, so some of the most dire, deep uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic moments. Mm -hmm. um, you had to set up a lab in that context. Uh, you had to join a team, uh, work with people who were remote, um, and, and you came to us from. Um, well, essentially, you were at uh, um, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, but also uh, between that and, and coming to Concordia, you, you were in the theoretical division of Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, for two years. Yeah. Um, so, so th you know, th these are a lot of changes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and and in, in, in those few months, uh, well, now two years you've been here, uh, you've managed to obtain your CRC, uh, NSERC Discovery Grant, John Evans Leaders Fund, Horizon Postdoctoral Funding, MITAX. You're on fire, this is incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so welcome to Concordia. Um, how has it been uh, adjusting to this new environment uh, during, during a pandemic? Uh, uh, I keep telling everybody that the piece of advice that I would give everyone because everyone asks, right, what do you want to, advice for people who want to be faculty, and my completely useless advice is don't start in the middle of a global pandemic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it to but, but it's also been really, it's been, it's been tough, but really good also, because Concordia is a very collaborative place, which is very important to me. Um, Los Alamos was kind of that way too, modulo their potential security restrictions, but right. they tend to be pretty collaborative as well. Um, 
it, it was an, a, a weird transition for sure. Um, I definitely hear people talking about how difficult, how difficult these few years have been for faculty. And to be honest, I don't really know, right? Because this is the only faculty position I've ever been aware of. Uh, so it's all just been kind of one long crazy fever dream, I guess. <laughs> and so you work in biophysics. Yeah. Um, coming from the arts and humanities, my first question is, what exactly is biophysics? What, what, what do you mean by that? That is a huge question, but I, I suppose the way that I would put what, well, two things. One is that I often say I'm a physicist who moonlights as a biologist. Okay. Um, another way we often think about it is coming to biological problems and trying to simplify them way more than biologists are comfortable with and hoping that you still come up with something that is useful and describes the world in some way. And sometimes it really does work out well. But as with any cross-disciplinary endeavor, you better have the people who are more, more specifically biology trained there to say, hey, you're going off to the moon right now. You right. need to come back to Earth. Okay, because you, you, you'll apply theoretical models? Right, uh, yeah. so you can apply, so for example, I do a lot of work in molecular dynamics, and molecular dynamics simulations are basically, when you do an experiment uh, with a microscope, right, you can actually look at uh, a molecule moving around, but you often can't look at it in huge amounts of detail because the resolution on your instrument isn't that great. So right. you come in with computational molecular dynamics and you literally just say, I have a molecule um, and it's made up of spheres that exist and interact with other spheres. And then I go all the way back to Newtonian classical mechanics and say, you can pretty much describe the motion of all of these molecules by the classical equations of motion. And then you say that, you get a computer to track all of them because that's a lot of different molecules you have to track. Uh, it'd be really hard to do with pen and paper. And then you end up with a pretty little movie of a molecule moving around. Or for right. example, some of the work that we did at Los Alamos was on the spike protein itself. And so we looked at the ways in which one of the mutations you know, you have your spike protein and the way that it interacts, the way that the virus gets into the cell is that the spike protein has to interact with the receptor. And the spike protein basically looks like this. It has three bits that can either be up or they can be down. And if they're down, it can't bind. And if one of them's up, it can bind. And so basically you simulate all of the atoms in the spike protein and you look at the differences between when it's up and when it's down. Um, but all of this is basically at its core, based on just Newtonian classical equations of motion, like how does a ball roll down a hill? Hmm. It sounds theoretical, but in fact there are, uh, and it is, but there are concrete applications. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, uh, spike protein that, that you're referring to, is this the one that, where you worked on SARS? Uh, yeah, this is right. the actual, <laughs> this yeah, is can, what can I did. Talk about that a, a bit? This yeah. is what I did, yeah. So, I mean, I signed the letter of, of the, the contract in February um, and then March hit and then everything shut down. And instead of working on toxins, all of a sudden I was the person who had the most freedom in my research because I had a fellowship. So all of a sudden I was working on COVID because everybody was working on COVID. I worked down the hall from a couple immunologists at Los Alamos. So I'm not an immunologist, but I do work that helps them out. So I'm sitting in my you know, bedroom, because we don't have a good setup for this, I'm sitting in my bedroom trying to send commands to a computer over the Mesa to run these simulations of the spike protein while my poor, poor husband is trying to deal with all the immigration stuff because I don't have time to do it. Right. <laughs> and th this is the paper that was cited 140 times this in the is past the, this year? Is, this is the big paper, yeah. yeah. We got a, it's a science advances paper because it looks Essentially at the differences, so how many times do you see a spike protein pointing up versus close where it can't interact? And uh, there's the first mutation, the D614G mutation that pops up, changes one little piece of the protein, and it changes the, percent, the percentage of the time for which one of these points of the spike is pointing up. And just by changing that one little thing and changing that one little 
point, all of a sudden you saw that we had that huge shift in the infective form of the virus because all of a sudden it could just point up more. If it can point up more, it has an easier time of getting into the cell, and so it's outcompeting the original form, which didn't point up as often, basically. Right, and, and so this research is, is published in academic mm -hmm. journals, mm -hmm. Uh, read, I'm sure, by uh, immunologists and, and, and vaccine uh, producers. Um, how, how I'm, I'm curious to know, like, how do, how does, wh what is the trajectory of this of this research, and and how closely do you follow it afterwards? Do so you have conversations with, uh, with with pharmaceutical companies, for instance, or is that afterwards? So I tend, I was very much on kind of the very early fundamental science end, so. And it was also a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I don't usually right. do. So to me, the spike protein is huge. I mean, it's tiny, right? But to me, that, that's huge. I usually work on things that are much, much smaller. Um, but this was great, because now I get to know a little bit more about how you deal with things that are huge. Uh, so I don't really work on the spike protein so much anymore. But we still have a couple papers in the pipeline from that collaboration. And I'm actually now talking to one of my co-authors. Um, so she and I both postdoc at LANL. And we're talking about putting together um, an, an Alliance International Catalyst grant for, to look actually at mucus, basically. Uh, so because, again, you're essentially talking about a bunch of molecules <laughs> that are getting together and they have different properties. And yeah. that's the kind of thing that you can really look at very well with a computer. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, and, and so the computer, um, you're, you're also working with artificial, artificial intelligence yes. uh, in your lab. And uh, I, I'd, I'd like to hear you uh, about that. So how does this work? How, how do you combine your, your research in physics, your, 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 your biophysics approach as well, and, and, and some of the conversations and work you're doing with, with the chemists and biochemists in, in, you know, in your lab? Um, and, and what might some of the misconceptions be about AI? Okay, that's a big that question. Con <laughs> okay, I'll break it down. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. <laughs> so how, how do you collaborate with, with those researchers um, uh, across, across disciplines with AI? And, and then I guess we can sort of tackle yeah. the misconceptions. You do a lot of talking. <laughs> yeah? You do a lot of talking and you do a lot of reading um, and you sort of do a lot of synthesizing. So what we're trying to do is still grounded in proteins. So what we're actually interested in, like I said, they're much smaller proteins. So proteins are all made up of building blocks uh, called amino acids. And in the spike protein, there's, I think, hundreds or thousands of amino acids that make that up. We're looking at things that 13, 10, 13, maybe 50 amino acids. Okay. And these are actually what we're most interested in are antimicrobial peptides which are these short peptides. They stick to bacterial cells and they actually puncture them open. There's some good pictures on Wikipedia. They look like puncturing open a tire, basically. So they just break these things open. Um, and what we'd like to do is to be able to design new antimicrobial peptides as ways of killing bacteria to help with you know, rising antibiotic resistance. Um, so on the one hand, we can understand that by doing these simulations I talked about. So we can understand like what, how does one of these behave? Yeah. Um, the problem is when you're simulating lots and lots of things, it ta actually still takes a long time. So, in, so if you do kind of the, the most obvious thing, which is just I try the peptide and then I change it a little bit somehow, and then I change it a little bit somehow, if I just sort of pick randomly, well, there's 10 to the 13 different possible peptides in the world. Right. You can't really look through all of those ever, and you certainly can't simulate all of those. Um, so what you do is you have to use something like artificial intelligence to figure out uh, the best way to look through your search space, essentially. Right. Um, so the way that a lot of the deep learning stuff works is basically you show, I'm gonna really kind of hand wave this, but you show a computer a lot of examples of something that you want it to be able to make. Like you may have seen all of these paintings and pictures and uh, photos of unreal people that these deep learning networks have managed to produce. 
So the way that works is basically you show it lots of examples of these things and you tell it make something like that. And if you show it enough examples, lots and lots and lots mm -hmm. of examples, eventually it learns to make something like that. So what we're trying to do is basically apply that approach to designing new antimicrobial peptides. You show it lots of examples of antimicrobial peptides and it starts to be able to come up with ideas on its, on its own. Right, so tens of thousands of, exa of examples that you don't necessarily have to test in the lab. That's, that's the hope. In, theoretically? <laughs> yeah. But um, I can hear a hesitation in how you present this. So uh, are there, are there uh, problems with AI yes. I I as used in this context? Like certain assumptions that might yeah, be Yeah, so there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, one is that I've totally simplified because we don't have hundreds of thousands of examples of antimicrobial right. peptides. So actually what we're secretly doing, what we're really doing is finding a good search space and then using another, a completely different machine learning algorithm to tell us how to search through the space so that we actually don't have to look at hundreds of thousands of things. We only have to look at a few things, but we're going to look at the right things. Okay. The second caveat is actually sort of a known caveat in computer science as a whole which I urge everybody to remember, it's called GIGO, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> if you show the computer things that are wrong, of course it's gonna do wrong. Computers aren't actually very smart. Um, another point is that you're, especially when you're dealing with these smaller sets, smaller, we have ten, tens of thousands instead of millions of data points, right? Yeah. Um, you start to have real bias coming in into your data set. And your data, your model is only as good as the data you put into it. So this is really kind of an ongoing area of research as to what is the best way of handling a small data set when you're dealing with an approach that works better on large data sets. Right, and have you found an inkling of a solution for that? Uh, <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> we're, still, we're still kind of working on it. One yeah. of the things that um, one of my students did was he set, just sort of tried a few different uh, deep learning models to see how they behaved, what kinds of search spaces they came up with. So they did come up with different kinds of search spaces, essentially different shapes. Um, and so that is, that is our, I'm very excited because that's the first corresponding author paper I've ever written and nice. he's doing his masters and we just got it submitted like last month. So we'll see how it goes. I'm sure there's a lot of things that we can do to improve it and hopefully the reviewers will give us some useful tips. But he just basically went through to compare these different models um, okay. to see, you know, is one better or one worse? Well, you're, you're mentioning a student with great <laughs> enthusiasm. Um, can, can you talk a bit about uh, me mentoring in this context? It sounds like you, like in the humanities, we you know our, our model has been that we work along alone because mm -hmm. we you know we think we're geniuses and uh, uh, but we're seeing scientists working in teams and, and truly collaborating and, and uh, uh, giving much space to students. Um, could, could you talk about that both as a mentee originally, mm -hmm. but also as a as a young mentor? Yeah, it's difficult, um, and mm -hmm. it's been especially difficult during COVID because. How much mentoring can you do from the other side of a computer screen? Right. So we've found ways to work around it. We have a lab discord where everybody talks together. My students will get hold of me that way. I'll get hold of them that way. Um, but one thing that has just been really stark is we are starting to get some stuff. It's mostly been me in pairs with different students because it's been so hard to do really group interactions. Over the summer and over last semester, as things started to open up, we started being able to talk to one another more. We started going out for coffee together, which is good because now I think we're starting to be more comfortable as a team. Right. And we finally had our first in-person group meeting like with all of the team, which is you know like four or five people. We're not huge or anything. Uh, last week, and it was amazing because all of a sudden everybody was talking and everybody was having different ideas. And you can just really see the ways in which you can get multiple um, angles on a different problem, which is super important. And I think that's why, that, that, you know, in science, as it shifts towards interdisciplinary, we're trying to do these, these really hard problems. So that's kind of why we're not really doing them alone anymore and why we're trying to branch from physics to biology to chemistry, because everybody has a different viewpoint. 
Um, and you can't really get a whole picture. You're never going to get a whole picture. But the diversity of ideas is so important. And just having multiple people talking to one another, having different conversations, is how we start to, I think, hopefully, <laughs> move forward in some of these questions. Yeah. And your students, basically, the lab space, if I understand well, is a computer space. It's computers, yeah. So they yeah. could technically work from, from their apartments or for, from wherever, yeah, and, and nonetheless collaborate. But but you you sense that there's something it's hard. that hap something happened when they met, right? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, they can definitely work from home, and some of my students do work from home part time, mm -hmm. and that's not fine because I mean part of what they're doing is writing code, writing papers, doing things that are fairly solitary, but. If you're trying to brainstorm, if you're trying to figure out a way around a problem and you don't want it to take five hours, right. it's usually great if you can just be like, hey, person in the next cubicle, have you ever run into this problem before? Um, and this is also something, I actually wrote a newsletter article for the Biophysical Society of Canada because I got to go to their first in-person meeting over this past summer. It was the first in-person meeting I've been to in three years, which was crazy. Yeah. Um, and I met so many people, and they were all amazing, and I wanted to collaborate with them all, which I haven't quite managed, because that's a lot of people. <laughs> but you get so much, it's, it, bodies being in spaces, like VK was saying, there's that energy, there's that ability to talk in mul to multiple people, you don't have to just talk to one other person, which is kind mm -hmm. of how it works on Zoom. Yeah. You get your context cues a little bit better yeah. when you're doing like in a group of people. So I think it is really valuable, at least where it's possible, because accommodations need to be made for folks who can't be in person for whatever reason, but it is important for people who can be together to kind of come together. And it also helps, you know, if you have one person who can't be in person, but everybody else can, they, th it'll mitigate, I think, it right. mitigates a lot more. If you have one person on a computer, that's not a problem. If you have everybody on computers, it starts to become harder. Yeah, Th there's um, a real discourse of openness in, the, in everything you've presented in terms of disciplines, in terms of people, uh, in terms of access. Um, I if you go on uh, Ray's website, uh, the, the Man's Back Lab, uh, you'll see there's, there's a poster with the binary and gender fluid flags. Black Lives Matter, feminism, immigration me issues are mentioned. Um, they specifically welcome applicants from all backgrounds. Um, so there's a very clear positioning there. Um, is that might that be because uh, physics has not necessarily been that inclusive a field, or could you talk to us a, a tiny bit about that? Or? Yeah, that's something that's very important to me. Um, physics historically has been pretty narrow. Uh, in a lot of different ways. It, it inherits a lot. So people like to think of science as something objective, despite the fact that, you know, one of the core tenets of quantum mechanics is what you observe, you also change, right? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is literally, you can't even look at this thing without changing how it behaves. And yet, there's still this idea of, objectivity that I think still kind of inherit, inherits from a lot of Western imperialist notions in, um, and, and please, I'm not a historian, so forgive me for <laughs> anything I'm saying that's not quite right, but um, inherits from some un enlightenment notions. And there are, I mean, science has done amazing things, but we always sort of think of it as science when it, it, a lot of times what people mean is they kind of mean Western imperialist science. and. There's a lot of bias, there's a lot of, of people whose voices are not being heard, and I mean, that's not fair. Uh, that's always kind of my first thing. I don't think that's fair. Um, and it's also, secondarily, not great for the field, because like I said, you need these different perspectives and these different ways of thinking in order to really tackle big problems. Um, so for me, it's both a practical thing, but also very much an ethical one. Right, and how, how do you bring this about? Like, what, what are different ways to introduce uh, that, that, that diversity writ large? Yeah, that's a good question. In ways of thinking. It's, 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 a really, it's a really good question, a really hard question. Um, and one of the things I've just been doing is, is really trying to say that this, to me, is a harder problem than solving the deep learning problems. Like, really, I, I think this is a harder problem than a lot of the problems that are that we're trying to tackle, because those are narrower, right? Those are more focused. This is a big problem, and it's sometimes sort of hard to for even formulate what the right question is, because it affects so many people, and for so right. many people, it's gonna look so different. 
Uh, so I've been trying to at least get to some of the amazing sessions that Concordia is hosting. I'm hoping to be able to get to some of the inclusive pedagogy workshops. I've been to a couple of the Let's Talk workshops. Um, I try to say this in scientific talks as well. Um, I've also uh, been part for a long time of a mental health and physics group, uh, as part of which I gave a little fireside chat at McGill, just kind of opening up about like what my trajectory looks like and how it's different from other people's and how I try to deal with some of the issues that are partly uh, neurodivergence or mental health related versus other issues. Of course, I'm coming from one perspective and other people may be coming from a very different one. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you, you've mentioned something uh, interesting. You're, you're, you're reaching out, you're going to all these talks, you're, you're, you're a very active um, university faculty member. Um, wh what are some of the, um, I, I guess, talks or, or, or even uh, faculty members you've been especially drawn to or certain ideas or fields? And earlier we, we alluded to, to the collaboration you'll be doing with Vicky and we can talk about that. But, um, what, 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 what interests you right now? It sounds like everything interests yeah, you. Yeah, everything. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of, I've, I've always been like this. Okay, My, it's a good quality. I, 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 we were talking about this before we started, but I mean, I nearly minored in theater in college. I ended up doing computer science and physics. Yeah. Um, I just get very excited uh, about making connections with people, I think. And I think what VK was saying earlier, you know, that, these, that oftentimes the, these things are really based on friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, in some sense, and that's sort of what, uh, what even going to the Biophysical Society conference is like. It's like you want to make friends, and people will talk about the importance of networking. And a lot of times what they mean is just it's good to make friends, right? right. Now, of course, I say this with a caveat, because when you have an in-group, it can very easily lead to you know folks on the out-group not being able to form those connections and form those friendships. So I think you have to be mindful of mm -hmm. the friendships you form. And so to me, it's good at the very least that uh, we're making these very, very interdisciplinary connections because the hope is that we'll be able to make these friendships that uh, are, are inclusive in some sense. Um, but it's, it's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. Let's take a moment to talk about the, the project with VK Preston. So for those of you just tuning in, tuning in, sorry, um, uh, VK Preston, professor in history, mentioned uh, uh, this ongoing project uh, around images of the brain, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, so bit? this is uh, a project between me and it's actually the brainchild of Professor Gautier in physics, Professor Cla Claudine Gautier. Oh, yeah. okay. um, and so she has a collaborator in journalism, Aphrodite Salas. Yeah. Uh, and she was honestly a mainstay for me during the COVID pandemic. Like this is where friendship and mentorship becomes so important. I do not think I would have made it through the first year, but she lives 10 minutes away from me and she was on maternity leave and sabbatical and we could just go walk around and talk about things. And if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't have known anything about how to navigate the academic infrastructure. Hmm. So she does a lot of in, in, incredibly cool work on imaging people's brains using magnetic resonance this imaging. This is Claudine Gautier, right? Yeah, yeah. Claudine hmm. Gautier. She does a lot of, and so, um, so I love networks. I, have, I, I, I really love, which are just things that are connected in ways, basically all kinds of networks. This is just something I've been really interested in for a really long time. And so she was talking about this project where she wanted to bring together journalism and MRI uh, to basically get an idea of the differences between folks' brains um, when they have had lo when they've had long COVID. So because you know, there's a lot of people who are suffering, as VK said earlier, from some sort of persistent neurological problems. Yeah. Um, and this is long COVID. We don't really know anything about it. We don't really have a diagnostic marker. And this is something that Claudine is very interested in. Um, and of course, there's that that angle of like, well, this is scientifically interesting, but it's also really meaningful to many people because it's actually impacting them. So it's really important that we're able to communicate some of the findings. So she brought on board Aphrodite. She and I were chatting one day and I was like, we could do something with deep learning here. You know, maybe because the problem is you only have 100 people's brains. You only have 100 models of brains and brains are, you know, every brain is different. This is a problem. 
it's not a problem, it's great. Um, but it's a problem if what you're trying to do is find a pattern. Right. So, so there's a history of people making synthetic brains, making ways of looking at brains that aren't real brains but look like real brains, and then trying to find patterns between those. I said, we could use deep learning on this. And then I said, and also, I know VK, who does all of this, who does this cool work in invisible illnesses and, all, and, 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 and disability and injury, and I knew was interested because COVID is having very real impacts on their life. Um, and I said, let's all get together because, you know, we try, we, this is the second time we're, we're, we're submitting this grant, we'll see how it goes. We've, we've been iterating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's very much a, this is something that we're all interested in and we're all coming to from different perspectives. Um, and hoping that we can have a bigger conversation about, if we get funding, <laughs> um, that we can have a bigger conversation about with the community so that we can actually, you know, not just get scientific answers, which we think are cool, but also talk to people about what they need, talk to people about how they experience this, and how much can science help versus how much can it just, um, how much can it actually amplify people's voices and be like, okay, we can't tell you right now, you know, what exactly is going on in there, but that doesn't mean that what you're experiencing is not real, right? And we as scientists can have this sort of authority that I think we need to break down a little bit, but it would be great if we could use that authority to sort of raise up voices of people who aren't necessarily being listened to because they don't, they can't just be like, look there on that test result, my blood, the, the blood levels of this particular thing are, are higher. Right, so this is a fascinating project, uh, very much in spirit with uh, everything you're, you, you seem to be doing. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you find ways um, to, to talk about that research between colleagues and you know, bi biophysics, computer science, journalism, history, performance, um, what, lang what, what research language do you, do you adopt? What methodologies can you imagine uh, finding as, as sort of convergent or, or divergent uh, uh, methodologies in this context? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, so honestly, I feel like our, our biggest problem that we're still struggling with is that, you know, VK's on the downtown campus and we're on Loyola. Right. So uh, which makes it harder to, to, to physically meet in person. Um, I feel like this is almost a code switching thing. So a lot of what has been happening is me talking one on one with various people because I ended up being the person who sort of went and I love writing. So people get me to write grant proposals a lot because I write them fast and I enjoy them. Um, so I, I'll go and I'll talk to one person, then another person, then another person. I synthes I'll go and synthesize what we've talked about and then I'll you know get everybody to tell me what I did horribly wrong and fix it. Um, but for me at least, it is sort of, an interesting, I hadn't really thought about this before, so I, I'm just sort of winging it off the top of my head. It is kind of a code switching endeavor for mm -hmm. me. Um, and this is maybe sort of the, the good thing about being interested in all of these things. I have a fair bit of experience, I mean, Claudine and I are both in the physics department, so we sort of talk in a physics-y researcher context mm -hmm. about, about medical and health-related research, but sort of more from a, okay, you said a thing I didn't understand, let's talk about it in a physics way that we might be didactic about. But then I go and talk to VK and I realize I'm much dipping much more into sort of my, my secret theater kid roots <laughs> and the fact that my, my father's actually a professor of political science. Oh, so I'm yeah. switching into a different mode of discussion than mm -hmm. I would for, um, for talking about this with Claudine, um, which is hard. I don't know. I, I guess maybe secretly it's all my theater kid background for me. I imagine different people would do it differently, though. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was going to conclude with, uh, with a question about uh, how your experience at Concordia has, uh, has shaped your research so far, but it sounds like uh, <laughs> you've answered it, and, and, and it's definitely... Um, well, definitely affecting uh, th that project, certainly. Are there other, other research programs or projects that, that you feel uh, uh, will be affected by, by, by this uh, easy proximity with different types of research? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because, I mean, even with the sort of slightly, slightly more traditional uh, antimicrobial peptide work that I was talking about, yeah. Uh, I'm working with Christine DeWolf in chemistry because mm -hmm. she works experimentally with these things. 
and I'm also setting out, sending out feelers to Mila um, because, I mean, they're here, right? Why not? And I was connected to them by uh, Maria Elise from Concordia, who okay. connected me to a friend at Mila. So I think a lot of this is, is, is definitely going to be affected. And um, another side, off, side offshoot of that project uh, is the, my, you mentioned the MyTax. So mm -hmm. that's a side offshoot of that project that was facilitated. Which project? The, uh, one with Mila the antimicrobial peptides. Okay. Sort of an offshoot. It's not actually peptides, but I want to get into that. Okay. <laughs> but that MyTax was definitely facilitated by the existence of the Center for Research in Molecular Modeling, which is how I got introduced to the folks at Molecular Forecaster with whom we put together that MyTax. And I think that also part of that, thinking about that, is thinking about ways that I can also make sure that the students are getting sort of multifarious experiences. I feel a little bit bad because Sam, who's doing this one paper with me, it's like just me and it's been just me and him for a while. Um, and I would lo love to get it if I could get him also some bigger picture stuff. Yeah. But I'm always kind of on the lookout. Yeah, yeah, next project. I'm always on the lookout for ways to expand and make connections. Yeah. I'm a networks person at heart, so connections are important to yeah, me. Absolutely. This has been mind-opening, exciting. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, maybe we have a few minutes uh, for a conversation with, with the audience. If, if anyone has any questions uh, on Zoom or uh, in the live audience. What are you expecting next? Yes. Go ahead, VK. VK Preston. I have a quick question for you around. The mic's not on. Hello. Uh, technology. <laughs> um, so I'm really interested in the deep learning questions that you were getting into because one of the things that we also realized is that we were showing some of the same representations to students yeah. because one of the outcomes is what what will happen if the evidence of the future is made by generated you know <laughs> machines um, and we can't tell the difference um, and I love the way that you were jumping into you know can we model bodies that are essentially entirely um, hypothetical <laughs> and so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the, the kinds of knowledge that you think emerge from deep learning and the ethics of it? Hmm. Oh yeah, that's a big question. So on the one hand, I think that secretly, so deep learning, secretly deep learning is really just um, a really powerful way of looking for a lot of things really quickly. Like it's basically a way of, of ge generating data points really quickly. Which is great if what you need is just to try out a lot of options really fast. Computers are good at doing things fast. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, that's what they're good at. Um, the problem is that there are a lot of ethical questions that arise from that. And uh, one of which is, as you're saying, there's, you can fabricate images. People know about things like deep fakes and stuff, probably. Um, and that makes things really questionable. I've also, there was also a really interesting paper on okay, we can develop good drugs, but actually we can also use this to develop not so nice drugs. So is there an ethical question of researchers in those areas actually not sharing their results openly? And this is a really hard one for me because mm -hmm. I'm really big into the openness of scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, but there is a very relevant question of our, if you can't, con you know, if you have no control over who you're giving your knowledge to, if somebody is legitimately a bad actor and actually trying to hurt people, and now you've just given them a way to do it more easily, that's something you have to sort of wrestle with. Um, so that's a question. There's also the fact that, like I said, computers are good at doing things really, really fast, and that is it. I cannot stress how much computers are not unbiased. Garbage in, garbage out means if your data is biased, your computer will be just as biased as the people who put that data together. And this has very real implications because people tend to trust computers because they're like, well, they're impartial, they don't have a stake. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you told them that it was important that, that, like you've literally encoded racism in the computer and you're wondering why you're seeing racism? Well, it's because you told the computer to be racist and it obeyed you. They're not smart, they're just really fast. 
So that's something that people really do need to think about and grapple with. Thank you. Sorry, was there a question online? Uh, I'm not, no, okay. It's, it's hard to yeah, navigate. Yeah, there's a lot of different things. I, I know, this. I don't know where to look. Okay. So I, I, I'm being told it's time to start wrapping up okay. anyway. So, uh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know about everyone here, but I've been constantly thinking of uh, ways to collaborate with you <laughs> uh, because you, 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 you call that, right? Like you, yeah. You, you're open to collaboration, you're open to networking, you're curious, uh, you're excited about the research. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you for having and me here. For showing us a, 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 really, a real cool way of being in the university. Thank you. All right, folks on the Zoom, once again, thank you for joining us uh, uh, virtually. We will take a little pause right now before the next conversation. So hang tight if you want to stick around for the last conversation.